So thanks again and thanks for the ah, okay. It's been recorded. Okay. Thanks again uh, for, for the invitation. It's a couple of years you ask us to, to come and it's a pleasure to honor this uh, invitation with Xavier. So um, in the first part it will be very brief uh, kind of commercial talk just to uh, put the context of uh, the HPC situation in, in Luxembourg and to broaden the scope to what happened currently in, in Europe in case you, you, you don't follow. And then I will let the real technical content to, to, to Xavier with an application for, uh, for a coupling, parallel coupling. Um, so first of all, a preamble game, <laughs> because uh, most of the audience is from US. So a small game, where is Wally? And the hint is in Luxembourg. And Luxembourg is this very tiny place between France, Belgium, and, and, and Germany. And uh, so there, there exists since 2003, actually, a brand new university, even if it inherits from a previous uh, uh, centre universitaire, uh, that has been now relocated in the south of the country. So imagine it's a big move. We made 20 kilometers away from the previous campus. <laughs> But okay, it's a new complete site. Um, it has been ranked uh, 12 among the young university in the Times Higher Education, and uh, yeah, it's developing there. So since 2007, uh, together with uh, Professor Pascal Bouvry from 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 Luxembourg, we developed this HPC facility uh, that is now composed of an expert team for managing the the platform, as well as different domain experts in the research units where, for instance, Xavier is a perfect example. Uh, and it has been a continuous investment, but it's very small to the other supercomputing centers you have access here. But still, for a, a budget university in France and around, it's quite uh, relevant. Um, so it's federate, of course, a synergy with the other uh, department. And right now, we reach a little more than 400 teraflops. And the key distinguisher is that we had to invest a lot in a shared uh, storage. So right now we are close to 10 petabytes uh, for, for the storage, mainly for our colleagues from uh, Biomedici. So most of you already seen many pictures of this kind of, uh, of setup. So again, we have this development there, only a couple of accelerators uh, on top of an IB uh, InfiniBand interconnect fabric, uh, EDR on the latest cluster generally favoring factory topology. Uh, for the storage, so this is a, we use different type of parallel on this UTFI system. Of course, uh, GPFS on spectrum scale for all on some project. We have lost over. Uh, 1FS is used for uh, synergy with the IT department and all the settings. Uh, all in all, we have to satisfy these uh, different uh, computational domains uh, from the university that runs on top of the different priorities that have been identified there. And as in many places, we have a couple of dedicated systems for different uh, workloads, machine learning, big data, etc. Um, Damian is still there, but uh, just like at Ulish, we base all our development for the sustaining the programs to our users through EasyBuild. Actually, we have a wrapper on top of that. so. Uh, new release have been made on top of the 2018A uh, toolchains uh, very recently, end of last month, uh, thanks to the big effort of the HPC team, in particular uh, Valentin Pogaru and uh, Sarah Peter. And right now it is 198 customized compiled uh, software, including, of course, for the MPI suite uh, and the APG. Uh, you can find the list there. Uh, so, what are the current and um, future developments? So, we uh, try to be more and more active in the European uh, HPC strategy. So in practice, one of them is this consortium ETP for HPC that brings several HPC stakeholders to decide about the future strategy for EC. Okay. And then, of course, Paris. Paris is a historical uh, consortium that brings uh, uh, the different stakeholders. You have one representative per, uh, per country that uh, federates the HPC efforts in, in Europe. And uh, last October, Luxembourg was a new country <laughs> joining uh, Paris, and we are happy to, to, to have them. But what is more important is that, uh, either because of Paris or not, well, okay, there are discussions on top of that, but of course Europe was very late compared to 
uh, US, China, Japan, etc. for the development in, in HPC. So there have been a, a new uh, fund that have been attributed uh, from the president of uh, EC Commission, uh, President Juncker. And it probably helped with the fact that he used to be Prime Minister of Luxembourg, because then Luxembourg gained management of this project, I mean administrative management, that will be uh, directed from, from Luxembourg. It will be this EuroHPC joint undertaking will be become operational 1st of January uh, 2019, composed by uh, public and, uh, and private members. Uh, and the objective is to build two pre exascale systems or similar uh, prototypes has been deployed in, uh, in China. And two exascale systems, uh, time scale right now is 2022. I have no clue if it will be followed, but that's in all case what is confirmed so far. Um, so once the joint undertaking is there and uh, ready, it will decide for the hosting countries for these uh, systems. And then this will be become a game between European countries to, to deploy that. Uh, budget is close to, to, to 1 billion for, uh, for, for the systems. And then in parallel, I wanted to mention an initiative. Um, probably you know more about the current status. I, I don't know. It's not perfectly my field. Uh, for to develop a European uh, processor initiative. Uh, the budget seems a little low to me, but again, you know probably better than me if you haven't someone there. And uh, for the moment, anyway, it will be probably US technology for the, for the processors. Uh, if we just scale down, and then I have nearly finished to give to, to, to Xavier the, the, the floor. Um, on our side, of course, we have a continuous development. So what is now quite uh, trendy on our side is that since 2015, we have uh, designed um, a new data center in this new site uh, to, on which I showed you the picture before. Sustaining two floors and five, seven rooms, and we already decided at that moment to have two rooms dedicated for uh, DLC equipment. And uh, these two rooms will uh, each of them sustain more than one megawatt of power to host this kind of system that is expected to be deployed next year. Okay. Uh, so with this kind of uh, capacity, we hope then to uh, become a more bigger player for HPC in Europe and to sustain the development. What we are actively working now, also for, for, for two years, is a National HPC and Big Data Competence Center. So this is very similar to uh, all the research computing uh, centers developed, especially in US, or similarly to the excellent uh, setup that is uh, offered here at uh, your, your supercomputer uh, center in a similar place. So we will adopt, uh, because this is also with the help, of course, of uh, neighbor countries, in particular for Germany with Jülich, the same kind of modular approach that you have seen, uh, seen yesterday for the, for in the talk of Martin with this deep project. So with different modular elements that will be deployed, uh, partially uh, in, at the university, but also in a complete new centers that will be able to sustain this kind of, uh, of uh, pre-exascale setup. Or Petascale setup, but we'll see for the scale. And right now, of course, so that was to present you the context. Of course, we didn't want to come without a <laughs> pure technical uh, discussion. So we have, um, uh, so Xavier now will present uh, what uh, has been designed and uh, developed within uh, the LuxDem team, is belonging to, for an efficient parallel uh, coupling of CFD and DM uh, simulation that has been performed on top of the, of the HPC platform. So just a quick, uh, quick questions for the uh, observation. I, I know some of this. I, I never heard of this uh, European processor initiative. I know. I know some of you are from Europe. Martin and all is with 120 million. You can gen uh, have a processor. Sh should I be? <laughs> if I'm honest, I, 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 don't know, I don't know. What do you feel, Martin? Let me say I'm, I'm, I'm new to Europe, I'm, I'm still watching that one. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, to, to my understanding, like a new processor and all, it takes billions of dollars. I mean, it's if you start from yeah. scratch, uh, might be... So if Luxembourg did get a pre-exascale, exascale machine, would it become the country with the highest per capita flaw? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not sure we are an eligible country to play to this in these different uh, places, but uh, yeah. <laughs>
and and uh, i had the one more question like you said you joined press so how does it work do you give all cycles or some parts of the so cycles to uh, the press so actually it was also a strategic moving so there are two two operational mode so one is just a member or observing member so you just contribute you have a certain fee <laughs> to pay okay. and then if you are uh, the, sorry if you are hosting member then you are uh, you have to contribute a certain number of cycles yeah. for people operating there and uh, what has changed is in the um, the the policy for Paris has moved to Paris too and if your country did not belong to Paris consortium okay. your researcher cannot apply mm -hmm. for uh, using these resources so that was also a good strategic move to enable a Luxembourgish researcher to use so the your Luxembourg researchers can now access machines yes. of all, all other and hopefully the national one will also contribute uh, one way or another through uh, Euro HPC of Paris to these cycles okay um, okay so so then uh, we'll follow um, with uh, um, let, let's thank the person um, uh, so follow, we'll follow with uh, uh, Javier, um, he is a, uh, also a permanent research scientist at the University of Luxembourg. Uh, he graduated in 2010 uh, from the Grenoble University with a PhD in computer science. Uh, his PhD work was in fault tolerance and dynamic reef configuration uh, for large scale distributed applications. Uh, in fact, he spent two years, uh, two year, one, one year, uh, one year in the MAPIS project. Um, from 2010 to 2011 and interacted with some of you. Um, that time he uh, did more on the fault tolerance, the checkpoint restart uh, work. So whatever you see in the MWAPIS library with respect to checkpoint restart, actually he, uh, uh, he developed that part of the, of the code. Um, so then um, he went back and uh, joined the University of Luxembourg uh, as a postdoc researcher in the parallel computing and optimization group. Uh, uh, headed by Professor Pascal Bowery, the same group uh, as Dr. Sebastian indicated. Um, so he's a, now a part of the Luxembourg XM Research Center and uh, uh, works under the supervision of Professor Bernard Peters on the optimization and parallelization of extended discrete element method. Uh, his research interests are high performance computing and computational sciences, and in particular, parallelization, optimization, debugging and coupling of scientific HPC applications. So let's uh, welcome them. Thank you. So, yes, as uh, Dr. Thomas said, I'm uh, a research scientist at the University of Luxembourg in the LuxDem Research Center, uh, led by Professor Bernard Peters. And I'm going to present uh, some work on parallel coupling of CFD and DEM simulation. Uh, this is some work uh, that has been done with the uh, student Gabriel Repotetti and uh, Albert Rousset and other postdocs of the team. Uh, so, a quick overview of this talk. Uh, I'm going to give some background of, on XDM, which is the software we develop in this team and the mm -hmm. method we develop, and uh, introduce the CFD DM coupling and uh, present some new approach we have to have an efficient parallel coupling. Uh, give some result conclusion. So, XDM is the software we develop in this team. Uh, it is based on a standard method which is called uh, DEM. Uh, the goal of DEM is to simulate the movement of particles uh, regarding to each other. As particles, you should see like a piece of wood, a piece of sand or snow or some uh, minerals, etc. So this is a classical method uh, and then we are able to simulate the dynamics or the particles move together. But we have extended this method uh, by adding some additional properties to the particle, like uh, a thermodynamical state, like temperature or uh, species concentration. So that's what we call the conversion part. Uh, so we are able to simulate chemical reaction between particle, heat and mass transfer. And of course, we are also able to do some coupling with some external software. Uh, in particular, some uh, computational fluid dynamics and finite element method. Uh, those videos are some example of some kind of simulation we are able to, to do with XDM. So it's very uh, various. Uh, for example, if we look at the top left, uh, this is a simulation uh, coupled with a CFD. 
where in the middle we have a hot gas and here we have the particle moving and that will slowly heat up uh, with the gas. In the middle we have a membrane deforming on the, with the weight of the particle and this one is using a coupling with a finite element metal. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go in details with all of them. Uh, uh, of course, uh, DEM and XDM is a very uh, computational intensive uh, software. Uh, that's why we need HPC. So this is a small example of a simul so this simulation. Uh, the upper charge and discharge is in two parts. Uh, to simulate uh, 15 seconds of, uh, of this process, we needed uh, 92 hours on 120 cores. Uh, in sequential, uh, this would be more than four months. Uh, of course, if we can get that in a, in a couple of days, that's much better. Uh, now, a quick introduction of uh, what we do uh, for CFD and DEM coupling. So the idea is that uh, with DEM we are able to manage particles. So in this example, we, you have about like two million particles, and we try to couple that with uh, a fluid and a gas, uh, which will be managed and calculated by, by another software or the library, uh, CFD library. Uh, so what we try to do in this case, we try to exchange data between the two softwares uh, to get things right. For example, from the CFD part to the DEM, we will uh, calculate a lift force that will apply on each particle and also a drag force which will be due to the velocity of the fluid and that will like push the particle. The other way around, uh, from the DEM, we have a distribution of particles that will influence the porosity of the, of the field, uh, that will make the fluid that will move differently. And of course, we will have a particle source of momentum, meaning like when a particle comes with some mass and some speed, it will also push the, the fluid. Uh, for this presentation, this work, I will only focus to CFD with DEM. But we can also extend our coupling with XDM, with the extended property of the particle. In that case, we are also able to simulate some additional heat transfer and mass transfer between the particle and the fluid. So this kind of coupling is challenging. Uh, why is it challenging? For many reasons. First, we are trying to combine two different independent software. So in, the, in our team, we develop the XDM software. So this software, we know it very well. We have the source, uh, we have access to the source. But uh, in this case, we're trying to couple with OpenFOAM. Hopefully OpenFOAM is an open source software, but you have a lot of challenges when you try to uh, couple with a software you don't know or you don't know very well. Uh, also, so if you can imagine here, you have the two uh, domains of the two different applications. I show you before all the type of data we want to exchange uh, between the two software. So this can represent a huge amount of data. Uh, and if you want to run that on parallel, it's going to be a problem. Then you have a problem with the computational load and uh, distribution of the data. Uh, especially because DEM, the, the distribution load of the particle is not uniform over the domain. We will get into trouble. For the kind of, the, of CFD, it's a bit more simpler, but uh, it's a bit simpler. But it depends uh, basically on how is uh, designed the mesh of the for the CFD part. And one other uh, challenge uh, with that is actually uh, the DEM part is dynamic. The particles they might move from one side of the domain to, a, uh, to the other side. So this means this will influence all the the compu computational load will uh, where where it will be. So for this kind of problem, actually, uh, many people already, uh, already have done some CFD DEM uh, simulation. And the classical approach, what they use, uh, is just they just partition the two domains with the two uh, software completely independently. And they run, uh, basically, a, a data exchange in a peer-to-peer -peer model. Basically, if a process a process needs data which is located in another process, it will just communicate and uh, that's it. Um, so, uh, an example of uh, what we're trying to do now. So, 
let's imagine we have a simulation where we're trying to couple the CFD domain in blue and the DEM domain in red. So these two domains are overlapping in space. It means like when I have a particle here, it's located at the same place as some CFD uh, cell. Uh, so if we take uh, these two domains apart, what is done in classical approach is to partition the two domains completely independently. It means that uh, probably the two partitions, the two uh, set of partitions that will, that will be generated, they will have no correlation, they will not be located at the same place. So you can imagine that if you do that, you will have some big problems because uh, when you will need to, uh, when this, uh, this particle will need some information about uh, the velocity, uh, the freedom of the velocity at this point, you will have to do some communication. And if you don't pay attention to that, you will have an uh, unpredictable pattern of communication and also a very large uh, volume of communication. That's why uh, we introduced what we call the collocated partitioning strategy. Uh, so the idea is pretty simple. It's just, okay, let's try to uh, create the partition so they're going to be the same or they're uh, between the, the, two, the two software. So uh, we take into account the data, uh, the space locality of, uh, of the data, of the CFD image and the particles. And we try to assign the same partition uh, between the objects that are located in the, in the same uh, space, in the same region, uh, in the simulation. So in the end, uh, from that, uh, what we are able to do, we can analyze the communication patterns that we get from that, and uh, we can identify three types of communications that will take place. Uh, so in blue, those are the uh, partitions from the CFD part in open form and in red from XDN. And what we arranged to do is that uh, those two partitions actually they correspond to the same uh, localization in the um, simulation space. So first, the first type of communication we will have actually is what we call the interpartition intraphysic data exchange. So those are the communications that take place inside the same physics module, so within OpenFOAM or within XDM, uh, between the partitions generated by this software. So those uh, communications are done using the native implementation of the software. So OpenFOAM has its own implementation on top of MPI, so we will let OpenFOAM do its communication in a normal way. Same thing for XDM. Another type of communication is uh, what we call the intra-partition interphysic data exchange. So in this case, it's the data that we're going to exchange between the two software, but within the same partition. So we see that those two partitions from CSD and from DEM are being assigned to the same partition number and same process, but we still to do the exchange of data. And what we're going to do in this case uh, to reduce the amount of communication, first, because we have managed to put the two partition uh, from the two different software in the same actually partition and then in the same process, uh, we're going to save a lot of communication because all the data exchange actually is just going to be done with direct memory access by reading a value in the memory. We can do that because we're going to link the two libraries together in one single executable. So we don't need to use any, even, we don't even need to use MPI, for example, for that. And uh, the third type of communication is the other type of communication that will take place, uh, so we call interpartition interphysic data exchange, because sometimes you need to access some data that will uh, come uh, from the other process because your particle is at the border of another CFD cell. Uh, so this kind of uh, for this kind of communication, we have to do something because it's not available within each software and we have to implement something. But we also realize that uh, we are actually able to avoid those communication if we manage to get the domains from the CFD and the XDM, the partition perfect, perfectly aligned. So in this case, uh, if we manage to get the partition perfectly aligned, th those communications are not necessary. Okay, now a uh, totally different thing. Uh, 
So this is the dual, uh, dual grade multi-scale approach is another approach that has been found uh, to perform of CMCD DM uh, coupling. Uh, this will help uh, for our problem, uh, but initially it has been developed to improve the conversion of this kind of coupling. Uh, so you will consider uh, two grids for your CFD problem. Uh, one will be a coarse grid and another one that will be a fine grid. So the fine grid will be used to uh, solve uh, uh, the freed uh, part in a precise manner. And the coarse grid, uh, will, the coarse mesh will be used to basically average the property of the thread uh, for some values that will be used uh, for the particle. Uh, and the fine mesh is used for, to solve the thread space. So with these two different meshes that represent the two grid at two different scales, we're going to do exchange of the different properties uh, that we need to exchange for the coupling. Uh, this exchange will be done by some interpolation and this will provide some uh, benefits because actually with the interpolation we're already going to do some average uh, from the fine grid to the coarse grid. This means that if we want to calculate uh, which, uh, which is the velocity that apply, the velocity of the fluid that apply on a particle, uh, if we want to do that with a fine grid, we actually need to do an integral of all, of all the surface of the particle. But if we use this interpolation, actually we already, already, already have done this uh, average of this uh, property for the particle. Also, uh, this type of approach, because we have no constraint on the fine grid, actually can improve the grid convergence for the CFD solution. So by itself, this dual grid multi-scale approach is uh, an interesting approach for uh, DEM CFD coupling. And so now we got this idea that we're going to combine those two things together. So the first thing was a, a collocative partitioning that I presented earlier, and now this dual grid. So in the end, what do we have? We have uh, we have three different grids. Uh, we have, uh, so with a dual grade, we have the coarse grade and the fine grade um, th between which we're going to have some uh, exchange of data done by interpolation and actually we don't have any constraint regarding the partitioning of those two, um, of those two grades. And on the other part, we will have uh, the DEM grid and the coarse uh, CFD grid uh, the, and those one, uh, we can partition uh, them using the collocative partitioning strategy we have presented earlier. Uh, thanks to this approach, the CFD uh, grid can be uh, can use any type of grid, and the coarse mesh can be adapted to follow the constraint of the DEM software. So. Uh, in the end, what we get, we get a better a load balancing for the CFD part, and also we can still benefit from the reduced uh, communication interpartition, interphysic communication uh, for, for our coupling. Okay, so now I'm going to present some first uh, uh, result regarding the validation of this approach. So very simple benchmarks where in this case, we have a single particle that will be accelerated by a fluid and we will move from one process to another. So the idea is we just want to make sure that what we have implemented and our things are correct. So for that, we plot and we basically calculate the drag force and the velocity and we check that first the value are continuous and also we check that we have the same result between parallel and sequential execution. Uh, another uh, validation test is uh, we have set up this uh, dam break example. So you, for this uh, example, you have a huge box inside. You have a column of water and uh, a bed of particles within the water. And initially, it's a dam, so there is a dam. But you remove the dam, and what's going to happen? The water will fall down. And uh, we are able to check it the position of the waterfront when it's going to move and we of course we want to check that we have an identical result between sequential and parallel execution and also for this case we are able to compare with some experimental data where some people made a movie and could measure precisely what's going to happen 
And uh, we are able to see that actually we got very good results because we got a almost perfectly matching a result with the experimental data and between sequential and parallel execution. Now let's go to the performance evaluation. And uh, then we are, we are started to run some scalability tests on our approach uh, of parallel coupling. So now we use a bit of very simple example where we take a, a huge box, we put 10 million particles, uh, 1 million CFD cells, and uh, we use our collocated approach where we have the CFD and DM grid aligned, uniform distribution, and we're going to run some scalability tests from 1 node to 10 nodes. Uh, and so what it is interesting to notice is for this test actually the load, 90% uh, of the load is uh, made by the XDM part and 8% by the open form part. Um, so the scalability test up to uh, 10 nodes which represent 280 cores in this case. First we can see that uh, the pure open form execution, so without the coupling, actually uh, does not care, does not scale uh, up to 10 nodes. Uh, this, is, this is somehow expected because from uh, some paper, uh, people recommend to have at least uh, 20,000 CFD cells uh, per core. Uh, so actually, this is a bit low to have open form scaling. Okay, that's fine. Uh, in that case, uh, the scalability of XDM is okay. And now we can actually see that the coupling is behaves actually even better at the end. Why? Uh, there are many reasons, but first we have increased the load, uh, the global load, because we put the computation from both, so it scales a bit better. And uh, basically, the coupling approach, uh, is the behavior is closer from the uh, XDM part. And of course, because XDM represents most of the computation, uh, that makes sense. Uh, now we've made some further analysis and we have done some weak scalability to evaluate the uh, communication overhead. So uh, we took a test case very similar, so very uh, simple test case, a big box fields particle, but instead of uh, now when we increase the number of nodes, we also increase the size of the problem. Uh, and the idea is to uh, check the overhead. Uh, so this is uh, a summary of uh, the result we get. So in this case, we measure the, the average uh, duration of a time step for 10, 20, and 40 nodes. And in each case, from one line to another, we double the size of the problem. And what we are able to see is that we have very good uh, weak scalability because the overhead uh, by doubling or quadrupling is 1% to 2.3%. And this is uh, very good for this approach because if we compare to the other result from the literature, uh, as I explained you before, most of the other approach they will do some uh, communication scheme where they will communicate everything to another depending on the need. But in this case, thanks to our collocation strategy, we are able to reduce uh, most of the uh, uh, communication. And if you look in the literature, actually for similar problem, uh, the NFIX, uh, they got plus 160% one, uh, overhead when uh, quadrupling the number of, uh, of nodes. And the CD form approach, they got plus 50% overhead. This is due because they have a, a basic peer-to-peer uh, -peer communication uh, model uh, in those in those work. So just one yeah. The previous slide. So how the total number of particles are increasing, but inter-field exchange is taking less time. Uh, because actually the uh, the part that will require some exchange. Uh, No, uh, this uh, I'm not sure. So the the difference is uh, is very is very small. So here probably we need to do some very precise uh, measurement to be sure what's going on. But anyway, the interphysics exchange is very slow, mostly because we just do copy in memory. So here, for this case, we we, we avoid uh, completely all communications. That's also because this case is a toy uh, example where things are uniform and uh, uniformly distributed and perfectly aligned. 
So now we made some experiments with a realistic test case and uh, we'll take again the dam break example with much bigger. So we got, uh, we create a dam break case. So we have a box, we have a column of water here and we put two sets of particles. So at the top we put heavy particles and at the bottom we will put lighter particles. And so we have uh, 2 million particles, uh, 10 million CFD cells in the fine grade, and we have, of course, the coarse grade that will have only uh, 500k CFD cells. And we run our simulation uh, with our both approach, so collocated partitioning and dual grade. And of course, the, we have a non-uniform non distribution in this case because the particles are going to move, and of course, from the beginning, it's not uniform. So here, this gives an overview of the different grids. I don't know if it's very clear when we see it, but anyway. And uh, so we have run some scalability tests. So this was uh, some, let's say, uh, a bit preliminary result is that we run very quickly with NVIDIA pitch. But uh, this is the result we got on uh, 2,000 cores. And uh, for this simulation, we're able to, uh, to get 63% uh, of efficiency. Uh, which uh, I think is uh, not that bad, but probably we can do better. So we're going to work on that because this is some work we just started. And uh, now it's going to be the nice part where actually we have some nice video of the simulation. So you can see, so at the beginning, uh, the purple particles, they were at the bottom and they are lighter, so they are floating on top of the water. And the blue particles, they are heavy, so they are falling down slowly. I can maybe show it one more time. So actually this video was run with a little bit smaller case than the number I gave before because the other one was uh, huge and it took a lot of time. So this one I think is about half the size of the one I have described. Um, yes. Um, okay, and so now I'm here for the conclusion. So uh, basically to build this new approach for parallel coupling of safety DM, we've leveraging two ideas, the collocated partitioning and the dual grade multiscale. Uh, putting that together, we, we managed to show that we can actually greatly reduce the amount of communication. Uh, and also, yes. Uh, of course, we still have some work to do regarding that. Um, one thing that we have to do now, we are using some very stupid partitioner. Uh, that's easy because those scales are very simple. But in the future, I think we need to work and develop some uh, multi-physics aware partitioners that are able to take account the constraint from two or more uh, physics software. Uh, also, we will need in the future some dynamic load balancing because we've seen with DM, the particles, they move a lot, so a lot of the computation will move from one process to another, so we need to rebalance the, the, the thing. Uh, here are some uh, links to the different paper describing uh, the different part of this work. And uh, yes, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>